again, and welcome to Man's Talk. I'm Tammy simmons Garthwaite, And I'm Carla Garrick. She's got the cooties. I do have the cooties. I have been coughing. I mean, we weren't here last week, so apologies oh, for folks. We both had... Oh, actually, oh, I had you the have a story. Guard. Yeah, I was gonna. Yeah. You tell me what you did, and then I'll tell you what I did. Okay, so uh, what I did between the the snotting and the coughing is uh, I was up at the state house last week on Wednesday for the defend the guard. Mm-hmm. Uh, legislation. So this had actually already gone through its public hearing, and this was a committee meeting. So it had been tabled, I believe, last legislation. Retained, retained or something, yeah. yep. And so they had a committee meeting, and uh, for folks back home, defend the guard. The position is so it's defend the guard, uphold the Constitution. Mm-hmm. If people want to learn more, they can go to defendtheguard.us. But basically, what it says is you cannot deploy the New Hampshire National Guard Mm -hmm. to active combat unless there is a congressional declaration of war as required by the Constitution. Especially since the National Guard is, uh, the New Hampshire National Guard is supposed to be the New Hampshire National Guard. And I get that it's all part of the army and the military and I, But, but I think we are using the various states National Guards as our army now. Well, so of course there is uh, problems with recruiting for the army and for most of the military. That is uh, twofold. It is both that people are too fat mm-hmm. to serve. Yep, that's believable. Uh, so that is a chronic health problem that is prevalent in mm-hmm. all of America now, and or um, that uh, that people don't want to serve because. They, well, they're just being sent into well, these and, wars and, you know, that don't seem justified, when, that aren't true, that are built on lies. When and, you're in active duty military, whether you're in the National Guard or the Army, you know, the pay is not phenomenal either. Well, like, it's not like you're, you know, it's not like 50 years ago where you joined the military because you either had to go to work in a factory, go to college, or join the military. Now, the leaner, meaner military isn't better paying. So I think, I mean, I think the benefits are still quite attractive, probably for first generation Americans. Probably. So, uh, you know, w- where people are like, oh, I want to serve my country. Oh, they'll pay for my uh, education. Oh, mm-hmm. maybe I'll get an FHA, right. a veterans loan, right. whatever those things are. So there are a lot of perks built into it. But on the flip side, again, you're, you're, might, you be might be cold in the desert for a to, year and a half war, or two years. Where there is no declaration of yeah. war so and and that's an issue because i'm pretty sure when we immigrated in 96 my understanding of america was the following and i had to like you know take some exams <laughs> unlike you know most people in this country <laughs> um you know i was like oh the governor is the president of their state that's what i was taught right like we have these states they're out, all right. competing you have like 50 presidents you have a federal government that's supposed to be pretty much hamstrung I learned that the National Guard was, as you say, sort of the local... The local military. I mean, they, they, they originally came from the militia, of course, mm. right? When you were still allowed to use that word without, you know, people losing their minds. And that the National Guard was basically like your state's little army, right? Yeah, like yeah. if you had a problem or if there's a cyclone or a <laughs> right. hurricane or a flood. National Guard, not, your, not the neighboring state's, states National Guard, you, your you National you Guard. You get your people... Because those are our friends and neighbors, and they are serving us, right? So all of that makes sense. It's local. You understand who the people are. Everyone's vested in in helping each other and all of that stuff. Because, so that was in 96. So I think with the second Iraq war, they actually started deploying the National Guard without like, like, they were never supposed to go to combat right, zones. Right, right. That was, like, never a thing. And then they just, like, basically, well, like, changed the uh, laws. Trust me, New Hampshire National people. Guard 100% was deployed all the time. Oh, over yeah. and over and over again. Oh. So I know people who were, I know families, you know, husbands or wives that went numerous deployments. Yeah. So so basically this bill, um, you know, which I think is is important from sort of a state, uh, independent state sovereignty perspective in the sense that, you know, these are our friends and neighbors. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the Constitution actually says if we're going to deploy our military, there has to be a congressional yeah. declaration of war. And I'll tell you, you know, like you're talking about, like, the sovereignty and everything. Economically, the, people, there is a burden on 
the state when its National Guard is deployed because those employers of those individuals that are just weekend warriors, right, now have vacancies, which good luck today finding somebody to go to work and fill those vacancies. But not only that, they have to save those jobs for the returning weekend warrior who was deployed. So it creates these pockets of problems with employers. And I mean, God forbid you have, you know, you're a, uh, you're a weekend warrior and you own your own business that your family right. supported from. You know, like, I don't know how they expect those people to survive. So, um, so as I say, mm. the hearing, uh, the it, it was more a hearing to look at the language of the bill mm. and to sort of see what the landscape was. I would say there were probably 40, 40, 50 people who came. I recognized a lot of veterans that yeah. I know who were deployed yeah. in, in uh, the Middle East. And, uh, and it was a really big committee, like 20 yeah. people on the committee. Uh, so they weren't taking public testimony per se, but they were letting people weigh in. Uh, you know, from the start, it sort of seemed to me like I was like, oh, this isn't going to go well. You know, it seems, uh, of course, also because, you know, there's a lot of talk about war in the yeah. air and people are like, oh, you know, and, and of course that should make us even more cautious yeah. about putting, you know, good people in harm's way. You know, we all remember weapons of mass destruction. We all remember, you know, the the, the murdered babies in the incubators, yeah. big fat lies, sort of like this Hamas beheading situation going on. They Basically, like to tell- Basically, you can't believe anything anymore. You Literally, cannot. you can't believe- You if should it, just switch off if, your TV. No, I mean, <laughs> seriously, if it seems hard to believe, that's probably because it's not true. And I would say, you know, just- uh, I'm not uh, saying uh, that the Hamas didn't buy, you know, all these things, but the, the, the no, but extreme, it, like even somebody, I was listening to somebody yesterday and they were talking about somebody sent them this picture and they go, and it's horrific, but I don't know it's from Gaza. How do uh, I first know of all, it's if, it, from... if it's the black burnt baby, it's not from Gaza. It's an actual AI generated photo, it's which really you can now tell because you can actually ask them to go look it up yeah. in the computer. So maybe they're good <laughs> for something. Um, but, but, you know, so, so based on how people were talking and stuff, it didn't seem like there was going to be, you know, it wasn't going to have any forward motion. Uh, Tom, Tom Mannion, I believe he's a Republican. I forget Sounds out familiar. of what, uh, I think he's out of the Seacoast somewhere, but don't quote me on that. He was the main sponsor. He spoke very eloquently on it. Um, and then, you know, a few uh, very old servicemen who I guess maybe had fought in Vietnam, uh, you know, we're like, no, we should send everyone kind of like, oh, like, I, you know, I had to go to a war that wasn't declared. So everyone else should suffer, too. I'm like, how about instead of that mindset, we actually fix the problem if it is a just war or whatever the pretty words people want to sit put around murdering other people for like some elites. Yep. gain. I mean, there are people who make money out of war. Yep. It's the banks, it's the central banks, it's the uh, offense contractors like Rayathon, BAE, BlackRock, Black Rock, State Street. I mean, Vanguard. all of them, right? Like, so, 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 so three. war is profitable for some people, but it also kills mm -hmm. a lot of innocent people. Yep. So, uh, so some people testified against it. So the read on the room, I was like, oh, this isn't going to be a good one. But then Tom actually asked right before they took the vote, he, he said, hey, who here is actually here in support of the bill? Right. And the entire room put up their hands. Right. It was a beautiful moment, yeah. right? And these are all, you know, like 28-year-old, 32-year-old veterans a lot of times uh, just being like, hey, I'm here to be like, I don't want this to happen to someone else has happened to me, yeah. right? Or I, I don't know if my I ages know. are I the know. right ages. Okay, so uh, everyone put up their hands. They then took the vote and it came out of committee 10 to 10, which means- No recommendation. Yeah, so it's a no recommendation, which means it goes to the floor with the vote to pass, right? No, it goes with no recommendation. So I will go with no recommendation and both sides will make a case. So it is going to become a floor fight. Interesting. And I think that is a huge opportunity for the anti-war people in New Hampshire, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent. If you're anti-war, we should all unite behind this issue. There is nothing... Uh, an ethical, like this is probably the most right. moral legislation I can think mm. of, right? We're literally just saying, hey, if you want to send our friends and neighbors to die, 
then you have to have the guts, Congress, to declare war. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the guts, you don't get to send yep. people to die. Yep. It's as simple as that. So I'm super excited. I think we can get a lot of people behind this. If you go to defendtheguard.us, you can get more information. There's a petition, sign up. They're doing the legislation in all kinds of different states, yep. right? Yep. So there are a lot of states trying to push it because they did try, I believe, long ago federally and that Good didn't luck. work so now really anywhere. what we're trying to do is do it is on it, states uh, level where it really should be right of course right and so one of the the testimonies that i thought was quite interesting too is when katrina happened yes the 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 louisiana national guard was deployed in the middle east so we right? had to send everybody else to louisiana so so that sort of happened and one of the questions that came out of that was uh, you know, they, the, uh, someone who was testifying against the bill sort of said, oh, it, it didn't matter that our National Guard wasn't there to help. Right. And in the questioning, it was like, are you sure? Because I'm pretty sure if you had more people helping with a really bad situation locally. Right. It would have been better. Right. <laughs> so I'm I'm excited. I'm cautiously optimistic, as I always am for everything. Uh, so hopefully that uh, that that can get the support. And people need to write letters. People need to Contact uh, their talk to your legislators. If you know veterans, get them involved. Get them. Uh, excited is probably the wrong word, but get them involved in this issue so that we can actually do something that will be good for humanity. So my Wednesday, yes, <laughs> I just wanted to tell the story because this is how absurd so many levels of government are. So four, nearly four years ago, I think four years ago this weekend, maybe four years ago next weekend, a bunch of vagrants, and I'm sorry, that's what they were, broke into our old house <coughs> that had been vacant, which was in the process of renovation, but because of political season, you know, was waylaid. Um, and suddenly there were at least six, God only knows how many people, living in our old home. I remember yeah. this. Four years ago, wow. mind you, four. Um, the day that they got there, I mean, it was this big to-do and everything. I know they arrested six people. I remember that. The only contact after that was one of uh, a female police officer called me like the next day to ask if one of the females who had been arrested could go back into my house to, uh, to, with, to get her belongings. And she said, you don't have to. And I said, good, because I don't want to. You know, like my house was a disaster. We spent, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars cleaning out, I think, two dumpsters full of stuff um, and then having to repair things that had already been renovated. And it was just this vicious thing. Keep in mind, not a peep from anybody four years ago. About three weeks ago, I got um, served, maybe a month ago, I got served a subpoena at like 8.15 in the morning, and I chuckled because I had this guy, knock on the door, and the police officer goes, oh, don't worry, you're not in trouble. And I said, yes, <laughs> yes, I know. Like, does everybody think they're in trouble? I'm like, so he says, um, it's just a subpoena. And I go, I don't even know what this is for. I called. I found out it was something to do with one of the people who had been arrested. Everybody else has already been adjudicated. This was the last one. Uh, you need to call back to find out if it's actually going to happen, which was last Wednesday. I called. They didn't know. I called again. It was a holiday. I called on Wednesday morning, or maybe Tuesday morning, to say, is this happening? Oh, yeah, it's happening. I said, okay, because I don't even know what purpose I serve. They want you to testify? Well, I was a, yeah, or? they were, subpoenaed okay. me to be a witness against this person. And I'm like, I, am I just testifying that I own the house because the tax records show, like, I don't, and that kind, they kind of said, well, it's about um, them being able to um, face their accuser. And I'm like, but I don't think I'm the accuser since nobody ever asked me what I wanted. <laughs> right? So I go. I get. I can't come to the show because, of course, it's dead in the middle of when we do. I sit there with Dan. We sit there for a while. Talk to this gentleman outside before we go in for a while. Blah, blah, blah. Sit there. Wait, wait, wait. Eventually, the clerk comes out, reads off a bunch of the names, and this person's name's not there. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here? Because I emphasized, please don't make me waste my time. So I'm sitting there, and, and the same the gentleman, government, the same Kelly. gentleman who I've been speaking to outside the courtroom says, "You look perplexed." And I go, "Well, I got a subpoena to be here in a case that wasn't listed off." And they, oh yeah, you're lucky 
because we just settled three minutes ago. So you don't need to be here. So I go, so I just wasted my time. I reshuffled my whole day to be here for nothing. And he goes, well, the good thing is now you don't have to deal with this anymore. And I go, but this is the first time I've actually dealt with it in four years. So I don't know what I'm getting out of it. So then the more I thought about it afterwards, it really irked me because one, they wasted my time. Two, maybe they did just re reach a settlement, in which case a good, if it was a business, which actually had to have good response, the first thing you would have done was call me on my cell phone to say, you're not gonna be needed. Even if that was three minutes prior because I could have left right. and probably been here, right? No, no. So there's none of that. And then the more I thought about it, six people were arrested. I, other than this gentleman's name, because I have it on a subpoena, I have no idea who was arrested, what the adjudication was. If this guy now, four years later, what was the deal? Dan goes, well, don't you feel a little better about it? I go, why? It doesn't, I don't get any better. Nobody called me to see if I needed anything after my house was trashed. Right. You know, the, the government didn't say, hey, you know, there's, you know, no, nothing. So, yeah, I wasn't happy with that process. See, and those things stick in the head. And next time something comes up, I'm going to be like, yeah, no, I'm not coming. Yeah. You know, like, why? There was just no regard ever in this four-year process for me. It, they didn't care if they, if it was an inconvenience for me after I numerously asked them to be sure that they weren't make, wasting my time because it's the one time I have something to do. It's just, it's not a good system. It's just not. Um, <laughs> Government, so that, it's not a good it is, system. And that's all I kept thinking was, see, they can't do this right either. Um, and the fact that it's four years after the incident and this guy's just now in court over it. Well, that's that it, is. That's because of COVID. Well, it's they, because of COVID, but it's actually also, it's it's something, you know. Having, they don't have prosecutors. They're having a hard time keeping prosecutors. Well, you know, I mean, obviously, I'm sure like the anti-government rhetoric that is around probably is making it harder to recruit people. I think, you know, jabbing people six times so no one can work anymore has probably also sort of yep. influenced the workforce. Uh, you know, I think there are a lot of things at play. I think we're in for like some horrendous economic oh, I, situations. I mean, I'm just literally looking at, I mean, was it Biden? Who, who went on? Was it Janet Yellen? It was some talking head, some 80 year old idiot who probably should not be in charge of even their own breakfast who are running the country, um, said, oh, you know, we, we America's the greatest nation on earth. I think we are, but we are also a 20, 33 know, trillion, amount of money. trillion dollars in debt. And I like to say this from time to time, just so that people remember. You know what you're going to do. One million seconds is 12 days. One Billion seconds is 31 years, and one trillion seconds is 32,000 years. So when we jump from billions to trillions, it's people a big have deal. to understand we are talking about like insane levels of debt. Every American now is carrying $500,000. You, you at home are personally responsible, technically for half a million dollars of national debt. So every time everyone's like, free stuff, free stuff, free stuff. Nothing's free. Nothing's free. And we're, we've run out of money. Like, so anyway, Yellen or Biden, I forget so which one it was, said, we're in. We, we, uh, America's the greatest, greatest nation on earth and we can afford to fight two wars, meaning no, the Ukraine and Israel. We actually can't. And I'm like, in, in what system of, of, of math or accounting or finance or ledgers does that make sense? We literally don't have any money. All we have is the perception that we're the greatest nation on earth and we're just giving out candy to everyone. But you know what? Everyone's got a rotten so, tooth. This is unrelated, but there, I'm just got a couple little nuggets in my head here. One, I saw a WMUR clip with Adam Sexton. It wasn't um, the Sunday show, I don't think, but they talked to Jay Ruay and Kevin Kavanaugh um, on the issue of homelessness. Anybody who votes for Kevin Kavanaugh is clueless. I'm sorry. His answer pretty much was, I think we should stay the course and keep doing what we're doing because we're, working. and I was like, what? Like it is getting worse, not better. To an anybody who stands there, I don't even care. I don't know if Jay Ruay's got all the right answers. I don't know. 
but to stand there and say, I think we're doing all the right things. And then he went on to say, because, you know, we hired a homeless director and we hired a drug prevention director. So even and he like literally said, we've hired employees. So it's all good because all he cares about is the unions. And, That's and literally all he cares about. And for people who have regularly watched the show, you will understand that by creating a department, all you've literally done is now you have created incentives for more homelessness. And if what you think I'm saying is crazy, please go look at Chicago, yep. San Francisco, New York City, all the places where there is growing homelessness because now you've created a actual economy so, around people being homeless. I, it's I, a problem. I have didn't actually watch it, so this is secondhand knowledge via Joe Lavasser, so I'm gonna take everything with a grain of salt, but it's probably fairly accurate. I guess at Tuesday night's Aldermanic meeting, um, Adrian Boulogne, who's the homeless director, I don't remember what her real title is, but um, she's the six month employee, state uh, city employee who now has her own department. Um, she said she was super proud because we ha now have the lowest barrier shelter in the state. Mm -hmm. Meaning we don't care who you are or how high you are or what you're doing. We're, we we'll let you in, and and then on the and then I went back and I was watching some of the Will and Joe show, and Will was talking about because Will has an insurance agency downtown near City Hall, and on one day he said it was on Columbus Day he had a, they had to call the police numerous times. One there was a guy um, masturbating outside their <laughs> office, and then there was a guy who took a dump outside their office in the mulch, uh. and then there was some guy who wouldn't leave like their vestibule, and I'm like. This is absolutely insane. And then my other nugget, because this one, I don't care if people are offended by it. I like, I'm like, I get to a point where I'm like, I'm not just saying things to be offensive. I'm saying things because this is actually what I think. Over and over and over and over, all we ever hear about is we need more affordable housing. We need more. I mean, there's whole entities promoting more Section 8. We, we, need, we need to give tax incentives. This was in, from the, this week's Alderman. We should be giving tax incentives to landlords so that they'll accept Section 8 vouchers, which means we're going to give it subsidized to t owners so that the tenants that are subsidized it's like do you not all get that that's all our money and when people talk about low-income housing like people are anti anything nice that's what it is you get the people who there's somebody posted a picture about the building over near murphy's and how it's coming along oh it's just more uh, more unaffordable nobody can afford that and i'm actually like no people can't afford it or else nobody would be building it and yes, not everybody can afford everything. Well, my understanding also of these bigger developments, I stand to be corrected, so if someone knows the right answer, let me know. But basically what they're doing is they're, they're saying, well, you can only develop if you allocate 30% of your of housing them. to affordable housing. So we're basically building the communism um, into the I development. Don't, I don't think that particular development has low income of any sort in it. And I think there's different perks for the ones that do like they get tax benefits because i noticed that too we now have a program where you know what used to be we're going to give you money to fix this blighted property fix the eyesore into something not blighted uh, right now we have all these uh, developers applying for it just to renovate their properties and i'm like i don't really think that's what that was supposed to be but my irk is i say to people all the time so let's be honest if you have a choice of who your neighbor is going to be, are you going to prefer the person who can pay their own way and take care of their neighbor, the property next to you or the apartment next to you or whatever, or do you want someone who you also have to pay part of their their expenses while they live next well, to you. And it's also, it's this sort of double whammy, triple whammy. Like when you start putting it all together, you're like, but wait, the, like like the last little vestiges of the taxpayer is getting punished in like 10 ways yes. in order to make sure this dude has his fentanyl so right. he doesn't and, crap and on your front door. I'm going to remind people that less than 1% of Manchester's residents are not living indoors. Less than oh, 1%. Way, way less. Way less. But I'm just saying, let's just go with 1%. That means 99% of us are, are taking care of ourselves or working within the system or whatever the case may be to like function as human adults. And we've put all of our energy, it seems, into 
small fragments of our society. We do it with homeless. We do it with the LGBTQ community. We do it with, yeah, you know, like we do it with very small slices. Well, so that's so interesting to me. And I do want to make sure we don't forget to talk about right to know. But, but um, you know, the, I think it was, I forget if it was New Hampshire based or if it was just some generic uh, American story I read. But it, it had to do with uh, trans children now having access to the bathroom of their choice. Okay. And, and I was like, okay, fine. But like, if we want to make things fair, wh why don't we just say whatever trans rights are? Everybody's rights. rights are. So, so it's like, so everyone can pick which bathroom they use and all bathrooms are now unisex. That is the fair way. That Otherwise you're creating a category of people mm -hmm. who have special rights and entitlements that everyone else doesn't have. And even if you are entirely illogical, you have to be able to see that that is entirely illogical. Pretty sure um, Dan told me he was looking at our health insurance plans for next year and that there was an option for specifically for LGBTQ trans, basically for transgender people. There was a special insurance plan to cover their special needs that is, I was like, wait, so you could have somebody who has cancer. They don't get a special insurance. So, you, know, you have people who are going to have kids versus not having kids. And I was like, it's, yeah, this it's, is just, we, it's we're breaking everything. Okay, right to note. So the Naki Loeb <laughs> First oh. Amendment Awards is coming up on 1026. The tickets are 100 bucks each. That sounds like a lot, but it is Standard, actually right? the annual fundraiser for the Naki Loeb in, uh, Institute or whatever it is. Whatever. They are now, they moved from out where uh, on the east side to St. Anselm. Okay. They are now affiliated there. The event will be from four to six, I believe, on the 26th at St. A's, so go find your tickets. I am thrilled to I was very happy. I that Lori you. Ortolano, who I've had on the show a few times, uh, won the award. She won it because she was relentless and persevered because she was right and they were wrong. And the court so much agreed with her that the New Hampshire Supreme Court, where they never do something like this, actually allocated attorney's fees in the amount of 62,000 and change against the city of Nashua. And they are being forced to take remedial classes so that they can stop being uh, the scuttlebutts that they are. And so, Congratulations to Lori. Yep, uh, get your uh, and and there's several right to know things coming up, but like this has been a big win. It's something I've been working on for a long time, and you know we rarely have any good news. So that's if you some have good any, news. Any um, Halloween type things or fall festivals or even holiday craft fairy type things, anything to have do between now and the first of the year, um, you can email those to a, us at manchtalk at gmail .com, and we'll do our best to promote them at the end of our shows. That's all we got. We got to go because he's going to kick us off. Bye, guys. Bye.